General Motors. For years, the world's largest corporation is set to file for bankruptcy protection on Monday morning. The Obama administration will finance the restructuring at an approximate cost of $50 billion. Our auto industry is uh, the foundation for uh, economies all across the Midwest and ultimately for the country as a whole. And had we allowed uh, GM or Chrysler simply to liquidate, that would have been a huge uh, uh, anti-stimulus on the economy as a whole. In recent days, the White House has intervened in the pre-bankruptcy arrangements between GM and its two largest creditors, its bondholders, and the United Auto Workers Union. 74% of the UAW membership voted to accept a new contract offer loaded with concessions. For retirees, the news was grim. Instead of the $20 billion owed them by General Motors in order to fund their health care trust, they will receive a 17.5% share in the new post-bankruptcy version of GM and one seat at the 13-member executive board. The cash owed to the union was the result of a 2007 concession by the union to take responsibility for retiree health benefits off the shoulders of the company under an agreement known as the VIBA. We asked Frank Hammer, retired GM employee and co-organizer of the auto workers' caravan, if he was optimistic about having his health care depend on the new company's stock. The American market, first of all, is going to take years to recover, if ever to the levels uh, where we were, which was uh, 16 or 17 million car, sale, car sales per year. I believe that's gone. And certainly with the, the, the takebacks from workers, as it's going on right now, there are certainly going to be fewer and fewer workers in the United States who will in the future be able to purchase brand new spanking new you know, cars. And the competition will be for a declining share of that market. I don't think there's any particular reason to feel hugely optimistic about it. Perhaps with the introduction of the electric car and some government subsidy that this may uh, turn around. But I think that there's, uh, there's going to be other competitors that are going to be producing electric cars. There's no reason to believe that General Motors is going to be the standout. So I, I, I don't see a great reason to be optimistic. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical, to say the least. While retirees are left to gamble on Wall Street for their health care, one-third of active workers will lose their job by year's end. 41,000 workers will be all that remain with the company, a 91% reduction in the workforce when compared to the late 1970s, when GM employed 450,000 UAW members. With the U.S. government set to take on majority ownership of the company, they will be appointing five members of the new board of directors. Six will roll over from the existing board, one from the union, and one from the Canadian government in return for its approximately $10 billion contribution. Hammer's optimism lies in the potential for a much more drastic restructuring being implemented by the new board of the company. The elephant in the room that's not being talked about is uh, the imminent crisis of climate change and if you take this crisis into account and realize that that's not a crisis that can be solved some other day, but if you really understand that that's a crisis that has to be addressed immediately, then we would be talking about refashioning a transportation industry rather than saving a car company. I likened it to the conversion that happened at the beginning of World War II here in the United States and the voice of the union, who at that time was Walter Ruther, advocated the rapid conversion of the automobile factories into uh, sources of material for the war effort, whether it be tanks, bombers, whatever. And at first the uh, privately owned auto companies uh, were very reluctant to make this shift. And it took a lot of uh, pushing, especially by the UAW, to uh, make this conversion happen. And the conversion was done rapidly in a period of about eight months. We need the same urgency today in converting, especially these factories that are subject to being closed, 
to produce transportation systems that are more environmentally friendly and reduce our carbon footprint. So by converting into a, a, a green industry, a holistic uh, transportation system, etc., we could be doing two things at once. We could be resuscitating the communities that are facing the devastation now. We could be re-employing the auto workers who have uh, incredible skills, uh, both in the skilled trades and in production. And we could at the same moment be addressing global warming. And it's going to take the political will to make that happen. And that political will, in part, is going to come from workers who are going to have to demand this. And by the way, this car company, General Motors, is still talking about coming out with wonderfully styled cars and trucks. It's not understanding that it has to be part of a solution of climate change. It's not there yet, and I don't see it forthcoming. And certainly the Obama administration hasn't pushed hard enough to make it uh, realize that we have to go into a different mode. In terms of what we have to do to be successful, David, we need to take the tough actions to restructure our business. But it's all about capturing the imagination of consumers with great cars and trucks, fantastic styling, winning the consumer back. So far, the government has shown no sign of any intention to implement the vision that Frank and other workers have put forward. Uh, ultimately, I think that uh, GM is going to be a strong company, and we're going to uh, be pulling out uh, as soon as the economy recovers and they've completed their restructure. It's all been about saving GM the corporation, and it has been very little about saving GM the workers and the communities. And even if it's successful coming out of this bankruptcy, the workers, the working class as a whole and the communities are going to experience uh, devastation for, for a number of years to come. We haven't even seen what the effects will be of the liquidation of a thousand dealers or more. We don't even have an idea of what that's going to mean, never mind all the workers who have lost their jobs. The bankruptcy didn't come as a shock to GM's top brass, who were preparing themselves weeks in advance. Regulatory filings show that six GM executives have sold all of their shares in the company since last Thursday's earnings report. And that includes Vice Chairman Bob Lutz, who sold 81,360 shares at $1.61 each on Friday. North America President Troy Clark sold 21,380 shares yesterday at $1.45. According to a GM spokesman, the sales came during a window when insider sales are allowed after quarterly earnings reports. Retiring Vice Chairman Bob Lutz, seen here promoting a prototype of the Chevy Volt on the Dave Letterman Show, was publicly praising the GM of the future while privately cashing out of his personal stocks in the company. For GM workers, watching the company fail has shed light on some glaring inconsistencies. There's been less attention paid to the financial arm of GM, of GM or the, the financial company General Motors, which is GMAC. The government has made sure that GMAC wouldn't fail, and all they had to do there was give GMAC billions of dollars, much like it has these other uh, financial institutions. No questions asked, no problem, but uh, and, and it's sort of like, okay, uh, we've talked about financial institutions being too big to fail, but when it comes to the largest auto company in the world, that doesn't go into the equation. It's not a question of whether it's too big to fail or not. In fact, uh, there's been some effort for some time to make it fail so that it can be reinvented into a different kind of company. That has not been done with the banking institutions, the financial institutions. They have been left intact. And it really shows the supremacy of finance capital in the United States. That is to say, the supremacy of people that produce nothing over the companies and the manufacturers who produce something. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, 
an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff, Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst, Antonia Juhas. The news magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington is a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a, this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower, who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country's governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matters. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system. We need the real news. This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not going to sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State. <laughs>